Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Selena Young. I'm an associate editor at Jack, and I have the great pleasure today of talking with Dr. Eric Canty, who is an assistant professor at University of Michigan and also the associate director of the BMC2 PCI registry. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining us, and congratulations on your manuscript that is going to be published in Jack alongside your upcoming presentation at ACC. It's focused on current practice patterns in the care of acute MI cardiogenic shock, and very timely given the uh, recent introduction of um, the danger shock trial into the ACS guidelines. Uh, I was wondering, Eric, if you could just start by sharing with us the, your rationale for the study and a brief overview of what you found. Great. First of all, thank you so much for having me and allowing our work to be highlighted from the BMC2 registry. So this work came out of um, really out of the post danger shock era. So as we know, acute myocardiogenic shock occurs in about eight to 10% of STEMI uh, patients, and it carries a pretty high mortality around 40 to 50%. And prior to danger shock, there really was a lot of effort with a lot of, with not a ton of traction of really moving the needle on that mortality uh, benefit. So, uh, in the post danger shock world, the um, which compared microaxial flow pump to um, routine good ICU care, um, we really thought, how do we implement or how do we start to look at these findings and, and uh, translate them into clinical practice? Uh, data also from your journal um, from the C3TN database showed that approximately a third of patients really met the criteria for the danger shock um, inclusion exclusion criteria. So with that, we, we wanted to look about at, at from the BMC2 registry of what is the, the care of these acute myocardiogenic shock patients look like in the real world. So that was really the rationale for the for the the study or for our analysis itself. So a little step back, the BMC2 registry is a quality initiative within the state of Michigan uh, to improve the uh, and enhance the quality of PCI. Uh, it's built off of the NCDR registry, and we have pretty rigorous uh, auditing of the data to ensure its data fidelity. And it, it includes about 50 non-federal hospitals um, and track a, a various amount of uh, variety of outcomes within the NCDR cath PCI registry, but also uh, some other variables for quality improvement. Um, we strove to create a danger shock like population and mirror the, uh, the danger shock uh, inclusion exclusion criteria to look at the both the incidence or the sorry, the prevalence of uh, acute myocardiogenic shock within the state, and then looked at it on a provider level and an institution level. And what we found was threefold is that one, the, the prevalence of acute myocardiogenic shock is low at each institution. Two, the average case volume for the interventional cardiologist, average interventional cardiologist in this, the state of Michigan is low. It's around less than one case per year. And then finally, we found that there was significant heterogeneity in the, the treatment of patients with acute myocardiogenic shock. Thank you so much, Eric. There is so much to discuss here. Yes. So let's start with um, one question about a finding that you showed that microaxial flow pump use was actually not correlated with AMI cardiogenic shock volume. What yes. do you think may be driving its use, if not case volumes? Yes, so I, I think, that speaks to one of uh, the key findings of this is that there's significant heterogeneity in the care of these patients. And, and prior, the pre-danger shock era, there um, wasn't really consensus on what the appropriate treatment for these patients was. Was it hemodynamic guided? Was it what your institution was comfortable with? Or was it what the, the interventional cardiologist or the critical care doctor was comfortable with? So I, I, I think that showed that um, there, there was not consensus prior to the danger shock uh, trial of what uh, we should be doing for these patients. Also to dovetail off of that, I, I think one of the things we'll, we can also discuss is 
we also looked at the use of right heart catheterization to draw, to guide treatment um, decisions. Uh, we looked at concomitant use of right heart cath at time of uh, MCS implantation, and we found that only approximately one in three of patients who had defined acute myocardiogenic shock uh, underwent uh, right heart catheterization at the time of NCS implantation. So this leads to, I think, a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in this field of one, uh, really streamlining care that by that I mean recognizing acute myocardiogenic shock, phenotyping patients early, determining are they actually in a low flow state? Do they have the hemometabolic profile uh, found in cardiog uh, found in the danger shock population? And then three, early support. And then four, a whole part of this is 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 managing the patients after device implantation. And I think that that's really where in the danger shock trial where uh, approximately one in four patients had a device related adverse event, that is really where the, the risk mitigation and the management is really critically important for these patients. That makes sense. I, I think many people might be shocked to see the low median case volumes that you present per site and also interventional cardiologist. Yeah. And I wonder, now this is a little bit beyond the scope of your manuscript, but do you think that the case volumes are necessarily related to directly to the outcomes? And I realize you're also, you have to divide this, you know, from the procedural perspective versus the post-management um, because, you know, we're probably seeing part of the picture here. I mean, the operators who are doing these procedures are presumably also doing these same exact procedures in other patients for other indications like microaxial yes. pump for high risk PCI and you know large bore access for structural heart. And so how do you think the case volume relates to necessarily the need to transfer them or uh, you know do we take a more nuanced approach to uh, to our strategy for for their management? Yeah, I, I think you're highlighting on a, a critical issue here and and uh, yes, microaxial flow pump uh, is used in other indications, specifically high risk PCI. Um, but I and I don't have this specific data to uh, to really point to does uh, in our consortium because we were not able to control for all the specific variables that led into the actual um, treatment decision. But I do think that your your point is valid. Is that we do need to start standardizing, really uh, focusing on shock protocols uh, for one recognition to the safe implantation of these devices and the, the appropriate aftercare of these patients. Uh, but I, I, I think it speaks to the fact that if the, these patients are there as a state, our numbers are high, but on an individual hospital level, they're low, how do you start to translate these findings to make sure that the one time a year the the interventionalist is placing a device in this specific circumstance that it goes in safely that the cath lab staff is ready to um, support the case and then finally where does um, when the patient goes to the ICU, do they feel comfortable with managing the actual device? I think it also speaks, and I think what you're also alluding to is uh, hub and spoke models. Um, we are not advocating that all of these patients need to be transferred um, to um, a tertiary care hospital. But I, I do think what we are advocating for is that um, there's a specific skill set and comfortability that interventional cardiologists who are taking acute MI call, um, we should feel comfortable as a community recognizing the patients, supporting them, and if you, um, and then if the hospital does not have the resources to be able to escalate therapy as, as necessary. And I think that that's an, an uh, site-specific and frankly, a, a, pr a provider-specific response. 
Thank you. Uh, maybe we could talk about Danger Shock for a moment. And, yeah. uh, you know, it was completed entirely in Europe and, of course, very different healthcare system than we have. And when we talk about Heaven Spoke, you know, aside from like the VA healthcare system in the U.S., we really don't have um, an easy way to set this up. And there, it's a real challenge in the U.S. I wonder if you can share some of the biggest barriers that you think we have to uh, moving towards something like this, if you think that's appropriate. Yeah, I, I think that um, individual systems of care are critically important to this. And um, what we are experiencing in the state of Michigan may not be um, applicable to more um, population dense areas like the east or west coast. Um, uh, but I, I think the key thing is that this involves a village and this involves all the key stakeholders. And I, and within the BMC2 consortium, we are starting to engage with the key stakeholders. And it's not just interventional cardiologists. It's creating a group of intensivists, emergency physicians and uh, interventional cardiologists that can collaborate and learn from each other. Uh, and with that, we can start to um, tease out what are the nuances of a hub and spoke model. I, I think with individual institutions and individual organizations or health systems, I think that is a critical part that needs to be uh, sorted out. Uh, but I also think in the end, um, we're all doing this to help patients and we're all, um, frankly, doing this to help uh, the sickest patient that you're probably going to see uh, on your acute MI cardiogenic or acute MI call for that for that year. Um, and in the end, I, I think it's all about the preparation and the collaboration with key stakeholders and then finally leading to education so that you have repetition and that you have the continuous reps to make sure that when you are ready, it's not just you, but your ICU is ready, your cath lab staff is ready, the nurses are ready to, to really care for these uh, critically ill patients. So could you describe how your cohort might be different than the danger shock trial cohort? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is related to the BMC2 Consortium, which is a um, quality initiative within the state of Michigan of, of 50 non-federal hospitals that are, collaborate together to improve the quality of PCI within our state. Uh, we also have novel variables that we work within the NCDR cath PCI registry that we use to uh, determine or to capture all of our patients. So specifically related to our trial, we strove to create a danger shock like cohort. And what that was, uh, what that entailed was um, we used the diagnosis of NCDR um, cardiogenic shock definition, which is greater than 30 minutes of either hypotension or depressed cardiac index, either requiring mechanical circulatory support or vasopressors. And then we excluded patients with um, either uh, the presence of right ventricular support or, or overt RV failure, which was the surrogate in the danger shock criteria. And finally, we just excluded all patients who are not uh, with a mental status of less than alert uh, after uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest. So with that, we found about approximately 2,000 patients over a six-year uh, uh, data collection at approximately 30 to 40 percent of the patients were excluded and that was pr predominantly due to cardiac arrest. Okay, that makes sense. And just to clarify, are there some patients who may have been in the danger shock actual trial that would not have been necessarily captured in the way that you have structured your cohort? I, I think that with our definition, we uh, were likely more inclusive than the uh, danger shock trial. Uh, the danger uh, shock trial used uh, patient or inclusion criteria was STEMI uh, with systolic blood pressure less than 100 with a lactate greater than two and a half and an EF of, of uh, less than 45%. So I think ours, uh, our 
a definition was likely more uh, inclusive and didn't have that specific hemometabolic component to it. Um, so we likely overcaptured some patients, but I think still it um, is within the confines of our data that is the best we could do. Great. Thank you Great. so much, Eric. Of it's course. a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so yes. much for your insights about this. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything.